Good Monday morning, kiddos. It is Monday, May 11th. Oh my goodness, I cannot believe that school, three weeks left. If you're a Folsom Cordova kid, three weeks left. So um, I know we'll get through Matilda and then I'm just gonna see what I can get through in the next uh, few weeks. But when we left off, oh my gosh, remember the chalk was just getting ready to write on the board. So let's do our pledge, it's Monday. So let's do our pledge and motto and then we'll get started and see what's going on. Salute. Pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I wonder how many of you have this memorized by now, hopefully most of you. And begin. We are students at Peter J. Shields. We believe in kindness. We are responsible. We are persistent. We are respectful. We are bucket fillers. We drop acts of kindness into everything we do. We are Peter J. Shields. And boy, kindness is just so important right now because things are just stressful for so many people, the adults and the kids alike. Um, I know on the news they keep talking about all the heroes of the essential workers and the doctors and the nurses and the other support people in the healthcare system. And I totally agree that they are the heroes, but kiddos, you guys are also the heroes because you're hanging in there. You're doing your best, you're tuning in. So keep it up, we can do this and we will be back together eventually. So in the meantime, that's over. Let's get back to Matilda. We were in the middle of chapter 20. And if you remember, I'm gonna um, go back and read a couple paragraphs just to get a refresher since it was the weekend. So hysterical and shrill was Nigel's scream that everyone in the place, including the trench bowl, looked up at the blackboard. And there, sure enough, a brand new piece of chalk was hovering near the gray-black gray writing surface of the blackboard. It's writing something, screamed Nigel. The chalk is writing something. And indeed, it was. What in the blazes is this, yelled trench bowl. Because the first word it wrote, Agatha, remember that's her name. It had shaken her to see her own first name being written like that by an invisible hand. She dropped Wilford to the floor and then she yelled at nobody in particular, who's doing this? Who's writing it? The chalk just continued to write. Agatha, this is Magnus. This is Magnus. Everyone in the place heard the gasp that came from the trench bowl's throat. <gasps> no, she cried. It can't be. It can't be Magnus. It is, underlined Magnus, and you better believe it. Miss Honey at the side of the room glanced swiftly at Matilda. The child was sitting very straight at her desk, head held high, mouth compressed, and eyes glittering like two stars. So there's the other writing on the, the board. My poor book, it's falling apart. Do you see that big rip? I love this story. Agatha, give my Jenny back her house. For some reason, everyone now looked at the trench bowl. The woman's face had turned white as snow and her mouth was opening and shutting like a halibut out of water, uh, 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 giving a strange gasp. Give my Jenny her wages. Wages is the money that she earns from her job. Give my Jenny the house. Then get out of here. Get out of here. If you don't, I will come and get you. I will come and get you like you got me. I am watching you, Agatha. The chalk stopped writing. It hovered for a few moments and then dropped to the floor, broke into two pieces. Wilford, who had managed to resume his seat in the front row, screamed, Miss Trenchbull has fallen down. Miss Trenchbull's on the floor. This was the most sensational bit of news of all. The entire class jumped up out of their seats to have a really good look. And there she was. The huge figure of the med head mistress stretched full length on her back across the floor, out for the count. Miss Honey ran forward beside and knelt by the big giant. She fainted, she cried. She's out cold. Someone go and fetch the matron at once. Three children ran out of the room. Nigel, always ready for action, leapt up and seized a big jug of water. My father says cold water is best to wake someone up who's fainted. Uh oh. He said with, and with that, he tipped the entire contents of the jug over the trench bowl's head. No one, not even Miss Honey, protested that. 
As for Matilda, she continued to sit motionless at her desk. She was feeling curiously elated. She felt as though she had touched something that was not quite of this world, the highest point of the heavens, the farthest star. She had felt most wonderfully the power surging up behind her eyes, gushing like warm fluid into her skull, and her eyes had become scorching hot, hotter than ever before. And things had come bursting out of her eye sockets. And then the piece of chalk had lifted itself up and had begun to write. It seemed as though she had hardly done anything. It had all just been so simple. The school matron, followed by five teachers, three women and two men, came rushing into the room. By golly, someone's floored her at last, cried one of the men, grinning. Congratulations, Miss Honey. Who threw the water over? Asked one. Asked the matron. I did, said Nigel proudly. Good for you, another teacher said. Shall we get some more? Stop that, the matron said. We must carry her up to the sick room. It took all five teachers and the matron to lift the enormous woman and stagger with her out of the room. Miss Honey said to the class, I think you had her all go to the playground and amuse yourselves until the next lesson. Then she turned and walked over to the blackboard and carefully wiped all the chalk in the writing. The children began filing out of the classroom, filing, excuse me, out of the classroom. Matilda started to go with them, but as she passed Miss Honey, she paused, her eyes twinkling, excuse me, her twinkling eyes met the teacher's eyes and Miss Honey ran forward and gave the tiny child a great big hug and a kiss. Chapter 21, a new home. Later that day, the news began to spread that the headmistress had recovered from her fainting fit and then had marched out of the school building, tight-lipped and white-faced. The next morning, she did not turn up at school. At lunchtime, Mr. Trilby, the deputy head, telephoned her house to inquire if she was feeling if she was feeling unwell. There was no answer. When school was over, Mr. Trilby decided to investigate further, so he walked to the house where Miss Trunchbull lived on the edge of the village, a lovely small red brick Georgian building known as the Red House, tucked away in the woods behind the hills. He rang the bell. No answer. He knocked loudly. No answer. He called out, is anybody home? No answer. He tried the door and to his surprise found it unlocked, so he went in. The house was silent and there was no one in it, and yet all the furniture was still in place. Mr. Trilby went upstairs to the main bedroom. Here also everything seemed to be normal until he started opening up drawers and looking into cupboards. There were no clothes, no underclothes, no shoes. They were all gone. She's done a bunk, Mr. Trilby said to himself, and he went away to inform the school governors that the headmistress had apparently vanished. The second morning, Miss Honey received a registered post from a letter or from a local, ugh, from a firm of local solicitors informing, him, informing her that the last will and testament of her late father, Dr. Honey, had suddenly and mysteriously turned up. Hmm. This document revealed that ever since her father's death, Miss Honey had in fact been the rightful owner of the property at the edge of the village known as the Red House, which until recently had been occupied by Miss Agatha Trunchbull. This will also showed that her father's lifetime savings, which fortunately were still safely in the bank, had also been left to her. The solicitors added that if Miss Honey would kindly call to the office as soon as possible, then the property and the money could be transferred into her name quite rapidly. Miss Honey did just that, and within a couple of weeks, she had moved into the Red House, the very place which she had been brought up, and where, luckily, all the family furniture and pictures were still around. From then on, Matilda was welcome to visit the Red House every single evening after school, and a very close friendship began to develop between the teacher and the small child. Back at school, great changes were also happening. As soon as it became clear that Miss Trunchbull had completely disappeared from the scene, the excellent Mr. Trilby was appointed head teacher in her place. And very soon after that, Matilda was moving up to the top form with Miss Plimsoll quickly discovered how amazing this child was and every bit as bright as Miss Honey had said. One evening, a few weeks later, Matilda was having tea with Miss Honey in the kitchen of the Red House after school as they always did. When Matilda suddenly said, Something strange has happened to me, Miss Honey. Tell me about it, Miss Honey said. Well, this morning, Matilda said, just for fun, I tried to push something over with my eyes. I couldn't do it. Nothing moved. I didn't even feel the hotness building up behind my eyeballs. The power had just gone. I think I lost it completely. Hmm. Miss Honey carefully buttered a slice of bread and put a little strawberry jam on it. I've been expecting something like that to happen, she said. 
You have? But why? Matilda said. Well, Miss Sunny said, it's only a guess, but here's what I think. While you were in my class, you had nothing to do, nothing to make you struggle. Your fairly enormous brain was going crazy with frustration. It was bubbling and boiling away like mad inside your head. There was tremendous energy bottled up in there with nowhere to go. And somehow or another, you were able to shoot that energy through your eyes and make objects move. But now things are different. You are in the top form competing against children more than twice your age and all that mental energy is being used up in class. Your brain is for the first time having to struggle and strive to keep really busy, which is great. That's the only theory, mind you, and it may be a silly one, but I don't think it's that far off the mark. Well, I'm glad it happened, Matilda said. I wouldn't want to go through life as a miracle worker. Oh, you've done enough, said Miss Honey. I can still hardly believe you made all this happen for me. Matilda, who was perched on a tall stool at the kitchen table, ate her bread and jam slowly. She did so love the afternoons with Miss Honey. She felt completely comfortable in her presence, and the two of them talked to each other more or less as equals. Did you know, Matilda said suddenly, that the heart of a mouth beats at the rate of 650 times a second? I did not, Miss Honey said, smiling. How absolutely fascinating. Where did you read that? Oh, in a book from the library, Matilda said, and that means it goes as fast it goes so fast you can't even hear the separate beats. It must just sound like a buzz. Hmm, it must, Miss Honey said. And how fast do you think a hedgehog's heart beats, Matilda asked. Ooh, tell me, Miss Honey said, smiling again. Well, it's not as fast as a mouse, Matilda said. It's 300 times a minute. But even so, you wouldn't have thought it went so fast as that in a creature that moves so slowly now, would you, Miss Honey? I certainly wouldn't, Miss Honey said. Tell me one more. A horse, Matilda said. That's really slow. It's only 40 times a minute. This child, Miss Honey told herself, seems to be interested in everything. When one is with her, it is impossible to be bored, and I love it. The two of them stayed sitting and talking in the kitchen for an hour or so longer, and then about six o'clock, Matilda said goodnight and set out to walk home to her parents' house, which was about an eight-minute journey away. When she arrived at her own gate, she saw a large black Mercedes motor car parked outside, she didn't take too much notice of that. There were often strange cars parked outside her father's place, but when she entered the house, she was confronted by a scene of utter chaos. Her mother and father were both in the hall, frantically stuffing clothing and various objects into suitcases. What on earth is going on, she cried. What happened today, Daddy? We're off, Mr. Wormwood said, not looking up. We're leaving for the airport in half an hour, so you better get packed. Your brother's upstairs and all ready to go. Get a move on, girl. Get going. Off cried Matilda. Where to? To Spain, the father said. It's better climate than this lousy country. Spain, Matilda cried. I don't want to go to Spain. I love it here. I love my school. Just do as you're told and stop arguing, the father snapped. I've got enough troubles without messing with you. But da daddy, Matilda began. Shut up, the father shouted. We're leaving in 30 minutes and I'm not missing that plane. But for how long, daddy? When are we coming back? We aren't, the father said. Now beat it. I'm busy. Matilda turned away from him and walked out through the open front door. As soon as she was on the road, she began to run. She ran straight back towards Miss Honey House and she reached it in less than four minutes. She flew up the drive and suddenly saw Miss Honey in the front garden, standing in the middle of the bed of roses, doing something with the pair of clippers. Miss Honey had heard the sound of Matilda's racing feet over the gravel and now she straightened up and turned and stepped out of the rose bed as a child came running. My, 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 she said, what in the world's the matter? Parent Matilda stood before her panting, out of breath, her face flushed red all over. They're leaving, she cried. They're all gone mad. They're filling their suitcases and they're leaving for Spain in about 30 minutes. Who is? Cried the sunny. Mommy and Daddy and my brother Mike, they said they gotta, I've got to go with them. You mean for holiday? No, forever, Matilda said. Daddy said we're never coming back. There was a brief silence and Miss Honey said, actually, I'm not very surprised. You mean you knew they were going? Why didn't you tell me? No, darling, Miss Honey said. I did not know they were going, but new, the news still doesn't surprise me. But why, Matilda said, please, why? She was still out of breath from running from the shock of it all. Because your father is, a is in with a bunch of crooks, and the, everyone in the village knows that. Matilda opened her mouth and stared at her. You guess what? That's where we have to leave off, and we only have one, two, three, four, and a half pages left. <gasps> Cliffhanger Monday. Not nice, Miss Kivley. I know. But I'll finish up tomorrow. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day, kiddos. And I will see you tomorrow. Bye.